Okay, so welcome everyone. We're at uh, Glenn today. Uh, Glenn uh, got a PhD in Leiden, 2005. Then he was a postdoc at Prince University, and also with a double fellowship here at AES. Then he was a staff at the uh, MP, the Marfan Institute for Astronomy in Heidelberg at ESO, before becoming a full professor uh, uh, in the University of Vienna. So Glenn is an expert and with a very big group in Vienna in uh, modeling of global clusters and, and galaxies. Uh, this goal of study uh, the distribution of luminous and dark matter in these systems. He also is a core member of very international collaborations like the Calipa survey and the Fornax Deep survey and Fornax Study survey. So Glenn today will tell us about the colorful past and dark side of galaxies and veil to population dynamics of the stars. So please thank you. Thank you. So thanks a lot for the invitation. It's really great to be here. Uh, so just to mention, we are in orange. Uh, so this is my uh, daughter Mitte here in, in, in front. She was actually born here when we were a member here. And we're in orange because today is uh, King's Day in the Netherlands, which is really a nice celebrative way when people locally in communities uh, 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 get to get, uh, gather also. Uh, so, um, aside from that, so I would like to give you an insight on uh, the group in Vienna and also before in Heidelberg. Um, uh, thanks a lot for the uh, uh, intro, uh, what we have been uh, building up. And I will um, go through three parts in the talk. And um, um, in the end, they, they're all connected uh, with the question, can we we cover for individual galaxies actually there as a uh, assembly uh, history and I'm just putting up this really beautiful picture that you probably have seen with these deep deep images where you really see the assembly history of galaxies in action. Uh, but the action that you actually see here, the stellar streams, etc., are typically rather recent events, rather recent meaning over the um, uh, over the 14 uh, gig years. And uh, what we have been trying to to do is also to uh, to ask the question: Can we can we uncover actually also assembly um, a history going much further back in uh, um, uh, in uh, time? And uh, so where we're heading towards is um, trying. Uh, to bring what is also uh, often known as, as uh, galactic archaeology. So um, uh, you've, you've seen all these fantastic results, uh, a lot of them uh, driven by uh, Gaia for our Milky Way, where, uh, where we really have this uh, cover. There was a merger event 10 uh, uh, years ago, the Gaia and Salada sausage, uh, whatever you call it. Um, as well as that we are trying, that, that we are really able now to uh, retrace back in time the build-up of the Milky Way disk. And uh, so this so far has been really focused on the Milky Way mainly, and then also our uh, neighbor M31 uh, with resolved uh, stellar measurements and uh, resolved stars. And uh, so what I've tried to convince you today is that, first of all, the, the, the data quality that we are achieving now is so good. And the techniques that we are developing have been developing are also so good that the combination of the two is making it possible to do, um, do the similar assembly history as we're doing for the Milky Way M31 on um, uh, also do, to do this for more uh, galaxies, at least in the nearby uh, uh, universe. And so you will see this particular galaxy, galaxy coming back a few times. There's been a kind of like a pilot galaxy uh, for us. Um, uh, so first of all, I will explain what, um, in, in, in a second what this muse, what it can do. Uh, but this is um, um, uh, like an, a lenticular galaxy or early type galaxy um, and a stellar mass. It's quite massive, uh, 10 to the, um, uh, uh, 1 1.8 times 10 to the 11. It's um, rather uh, extended with a half light radius, effective radius of 5.8 kiloparsec, and it's at a distance of 21.2 uh, uh, megaparsec, which puts it in the Fornax uh, cluster. And uh, so you will see this galaxy back in, uh, a few times. Okay, it should work. Yeah, so first, what is these squares? These squares are this uh, the the, uh, the field of view of the MUSE instruments. And so the MUSE instrument is on the VLT, um, so it's an ESO. Uh, so if you have not uh, seen or heard about it, this is a truly fantastic instrument. This has been a game uh, changer over the last few years. And so what is this instrument? This is a so-called integral field 
uh, unit uh, um, and you can do a spectroscopy with it, you really get data cubes. Uh, so it's staring, it's this pointing at the galaxy at every point of that galaxy, you get a, a spectrum in the optical range. And so um, that is enormous amount of data because every data cube has 90,000 spectra. And uh, so first of all, there's a techn technological challenge to extract data from that. Um, and so one <laughs> technique, to which I'll show you one, uh, one figure here, I'm not sure I'll just point it, is uh, that if you want to get the maximum out of these spectra, you want to really use each pixel. But uh, not every pixel is as useful. We know already beforehand. Um, if we talk about stellar populations, especially the in so the so-called absorption feature, interesting. If you try to fit the full spectrum, you spend a huge amount of computational time, also on regions where there's mostly noise. Yes. Yeah? So what we do, we have found a hybrid in the sense that the traditional way is to just measure so-called index index, so one number per absorption feature. And what we do is we really go around the region of an absorption feature and then fit it pixel by pixel. So this hybrid uh, uh, approach has made it possible for us to extract uh, in, a, in a really efficient way, also computational efficient way, really a lot of information. So here you see some uh, in, uh, index uh, measurements. Okay, great. But how does this then look like? Uh, so I'll show you first the focus on the stellar populations. And so we will start again with the same galaxy. Now you see the four pointings um, in here, but now you see a map um, and there are uh, bins in here and every bin has a particular measurement. And this particular measurement is now is the uh, stellar age. And so in the center, there are, they are not even spatially bent. There are like 20,000 independent measurements uh, just in this map of the stellar age. And you see that this from the age on the bottom, this, uh, this is a very old uh, uh, stellar population from 10 to 30.5 gig year. Um, and um, the oldest in the center, and then there's a, a gradient outwards. So in addition to the stellar age, we can also extract uh, very reliably the stellar metallicity. So it's shown on the, uh, on, uh, on the bottom here. And then you already see feature that this is uh, quite a narrow um, range there, which is a kind of like, it looks like a disk uh, feature there. So already these maps, there's a lot of information. So uh, how are we extract more uh, with the quality of data. So this is, for example, a measurement of the alpha, uh, alpha abundance. And on the right is something which is really, really, really new. So this is um, a measurement um, of uh, the dwarf to giant ratios, yes? And this tells you something about the mass function, or you can couple it back with model to the uh, initial mass function. And so this is also sometimes referred as the slope of the initial mass function. So you might remember from like about 10 years ago, this was first done, uh, where there was this claim that in the centers of big elliptical galaxies, there was an overabundance, um, relatively more dwarf uh, stars than uh, giant stars. So now uh, we have come that far with this data. We not only get a single measurement per galaxy in the center, but we actually can map this out comp uh, comp uh, 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 neatly. Um, uh, and so this is now, Cable with this kind of data, we have maps published of this of 30 galaxies now. So, okay, good. So that, like, yeah, yes, a question. yes, of so course. How do you uh, sort of the methodology? Like you're picking yeah. a point on a sky and you are, are assigning a value of metallicity, uh, age, uh, and everything to this yeah. point. Yeah. But uh, I mean, this is a three dimensional situation, right? Yes. So you are actually averaging, if you're assuming that everything is a function of radius and you have yes. an integral over this, you know, I'll ages, go back to that. and so yes. on. So you're not doing this backward reconstruction, you're just assigning a single age and metallicity. Yeah. So, uh, yes and no. Uh, so, first of all, this reconstruction, this re rebuilding, or uh, comes back in the third part. Uh, and but also to tell you, no, we can get more than a single age. Yes, so we can get the full star formation history uh, per spectrum along, along, this. along the along the line of sight. Yes. And so, um, uh, uh, but for now, what we I'll focus on is is the mean light weighted um, mm -hmm. H uh, H map. But okay. um, in we we do have the information already um, along the line of sight. So sometimes we have to bin 
uh, uh, bigger than to get the highest you know, the noise ratio to to get a better uh, star formation history. But that's and also metallistic distribution along the line along the line of sight. So talking about this metallicity distribution. So once you have this metallicity distribution, actually. Um, so at a single point, then you can actually measure and you have a control of your instrument system and you can measure its width. So you can measure the dispersion in a region of the metallicity. And so why is this dispersion and average metallicity interesting? This is just to give you an example on a PhD student is working on it. If you plot then this measured intrinsic dispersion in the metallicity versus its mean metallicity, then if you look at, at a simple self enriching on models, so if you have a closed box and you, you let the generations of stars go on, then the mean metallicity will increase and also the intrinsic spreads will increase. This will bring you along this self enrichment uh, sequence here. And this has been shown observationally by looking at individual galaxies, or for example, dwarf galaxies, um, um, uh, in resolved star, measure the spread, measure the mean metallicity, and they all follow this line actually extremely nice. This is a very tight correlation. Yes. So how do you, if you get deviations from this line, something is happening. And the, the, the main basic thing that can happen is what we call the over, the, over this uh, uh, version, if you mix that nicely in situ formed population with an external. So if you merge, like you have a host galaxy and you merge the satellite galaxy with it, suddenly you mix it with a different metallicity and a different chemically enriched. And so you can show this also very nice by simulation. Suddenly you jump off this, uh, uh, this uh, relation and that over dispersion factor is a directly measure on, uh, um, on how massive this merger was. So if you can measure this and you can see here in the, in the background, uh, these are actually measurements literally for this galaxy from these different bins. And you see that most of it more or less forms along the, the self enrichment feature. We are still investigating why it is peaking out a little bit here. But you see also clear jumps. And these jumps typically happen in the outer parts. And I can show you a map that there's a certain region here where this is most jumping out. Yes. And so this is um, a very strong indication that this galaxy had significant mergers in the past. And I will come back to it a few times. There is more evidence. Uh, from uh, uh, independent evidence from this. So why are we uh, so excited about this? Because we want to use this to convert this measure, direct measure into uh, mapping this into a, what's sometimes called exito fraction. So if you go to a region of the sky and you ask them for the galaxy, how many of the stars were formed in situ and how many of the stars were brought in? That is this exito uh, fraction. And now this is still, this is a, a simulated galaxy, it's not the same, but this is a show the proof of concept. On the left is what we did, we took from the TG50 simulation, we made an IFU cube of this simulation, we measured the metallicity, and then we measured from the metallicity map exactly this, uh, this sigma squared, and then this measurement is how much it's above the line. And this is literally plotted for the different regions here, this, this, this so-called over dispersion factor. And of course, because simulation, we know exactly in every region, how much of the stars were brought in, or what is uh, what, what another term is the uh, local x situ uh, fraction. So this is where we want to go also with observation, use such measurements to get a direct handle on how much of the stars are formed, uh, are uh, created here. Yeah, I just was wondering when you have this under this version, is there a simple story how it happens? Yes, so we know that, for example, global clusters and open clusters are actually below this line. Yes. Uh, so um, um, so they, they, uh, they, they form differently than, than a galaxy forms its, uh, its stars. And so, um, uh, but, to be, but, to, but to be clear to you, we still investigate the why, why this happened, but we know of, uh, systems that observationally are below this line. So that's, that's what we're trying to figure out. Is this related to a, a, a different self enrichment system happening in galaxies versus these stellar clusters? Will that tell us something why that is uh, that line is uh, below there? And the other aspects, we can not only do this over the dispersion effect for metallicity, but also for alpha or for, for, uh, for magnesium. And the pattern looks different. And the simulation tells us it should look different. So this is, this is a PhD student uh, which investigated this. And this opened up a completely new, we didn't expect that this 
honestly, we didn't expect it would work so well. Yeah, so this 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 figure here with the simulation was a post surprise that it would uh, correlate uh, uh, so uh, uh, nicely. So this is an example. So then then we have handle per galaxy extragalactic not only on on the global exito fraction, which is already hard to measure, but now we can actually map it out, and so we can start thinking really. Um, this from the simulated that we know, like, okay, um, uh, we know the amount of mergers that happen to the galaxy. Yes. Yeah. So, so should I think of this ex situ as from uh, not just internal mixing, like, like critical events where you actually have mergers or something? Yeah. So then you understand how much uh, of dispersion there is because you said you, you, you have this box and, and that's where you get this line, and then you also see it in the simulation. But in principle, if you don't understand the potential, the galaxy, I would imagine that that also introduces some uncertainty in the dispersion, or is that just? No, it turns out to be, uh, what do you mean, you mean a gravitation potential that it depends on? Yeah, you just have mixing internally. Yes, there is, there is uh, radial mixing, for example, in, uh, in, uh, uh, internally, but um, that radial mixing actually uh, brings us um, uh, pretty close to the line. Yes, so it's, it, 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 it doesn't deviate you from that. To deviate from the line, you really have to add from, uh, uh, from outside, as far as we can see now from the simulations, that's, uh, that's what's happening. So the question now is, okay, that is nice. You get an exit of fraction. So now you can go to multiple of these galaxies and get the handle on like um, how many merge, of, like in total, uh, how, how, how much material, how many stars were merged. But what we really would like to know, can we actually get a full merger history and then compare this with uh, simulations? And so this is um, uh, this is a work by uh, Alina Böker. So she will also join. Um, I'm really happy about it in uh, 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 in uh, Vienna in uh, January for her work. Um, uh, this was her master and um, partially her PhD work. Uh, she asked this question, can I get uh, this is an equal simulation in this case. Can I get from my information that I extract from a single spectrum? So you combine all the information for all galaxies in a single spectrum. Can I do I are the stellar population modeling and the quality of the spectra so good that I can actually extract a distribution in both at the same time in each metallist? So can I get both star formation history and a metallist distribution? And so this is shown here. Metallistic distribution and H distribution, this is from the simulation from the particles. Yes, so there it's of course easy. And then ask the question, okay, this, this is filled up with stars that formed in C so in the host galaxy itself, but it's also of course what has been contributed again to here is the green stars. And if you think about it, it makes intuitively sense because if you would create a dwarf galaxy, a dwarf galaxy is typically lower mass. We know from that metallistic relation, that means that also the metallicity will be lower. Yes. And so you would expect that if you have dwarf galaxies, that they would add more to the lower metallicity, it would be here. And that's what you then can nicely see in the simulations. If you if you split up like the stars from the galaxies or the satellites from which they were contributed. Yes, so these numbers here are the mass of the satellite that contributed to this big elliptical simulated elliptical galaxy. The key point here is that you see there are certain patterns in there. Another question is, can we extract such a map observationally? Answer is yes. And then uh, can we use these patterns actually to understand statistically how many how many mergers of which mass were there. And so after like a lot of uh, work, so in the background, for example, uh, what you see here is then you take the simulation, you make an IFQ cube to it, and then you extract this information, and then you will need some mathematical smoothening on top of it, but that is the map that you get in the background. And then these curves here are empirically uh, curves of uh, the evolution of stars in a system of a given host mass. So, for example, 10 to the 6, that would be dwarf of 10 to 6 stellar mass. Then we expect the stars to more or less follow this curve, of course, with a certain spread. Yes. So now you can do the statistical game and ask, okay, let's assume that all the stars that are below this curve, they were brought in by dwarf galaxies of 10 to the 6 or lower. Yes. So you literally can't 
than the number of stars below here. Then you go to the next one, and then you say every every star below here and here is the one that you count to 10 to the, what is it, sorry, 10 to the seven uh, host mass, etc. So you do this counting. And then in the end, what you get is a, cum a cum cumulative curve. So you say 10 to the six, there are so, uh, the fraction of stars is here, or you can convert it then to the mass, and then 10 to the seven and below, 10 to the eight, below 10 to the nine, below, et cetera, until you hit the point, of course, that you have the host galaxy itself. And so this you can then turn, of course, in the number of accreted satellite galaxy of that mass. Yes. So, of course, now the question is, this is all nice, but is, is this working? Yes, does this actually bring you somewhere? Because you see it's overlapping, et cetera. And so she did do this, this test. So the, the red curve here would be the true cumulative curve of, again, the fraction of mass uh, accreted from satellite loads and satellites and et cetera. And the yellow is uh, with orange band around is what she would get through going through this whole spectroscopic method. And you see, um, uh, see that it is a quite good match, and you can convert this graph then uh, to really the cumulative satellite mass function. And what turns out to be very, very robust in, in this is that you get the slope of this mass function actually really well constrained. So um, we are now at the stage that we um, have developed this technique, applied it to simulations, and now we're trying it on real data. And of course, if you try it on real data, then suddenly you realize that you didn't understand your data good enough to do this. Yeah, so we're now really fighting as why in that particular region of the spectra, do we get a, do we get a, a strange blob here? And then we learn that we didn't understand our telluric corrections good enough or some features. So we are now in the process of iterating uh, why why we don't why we get measurements which are not as expected. But in principle, the technique has now been applied to a few galaxies and it gives reasonable results. But we are uh, we are in trouble uh, uh, checking. So we are really excited because now, as you see from the stellar population point of view, we can map out the exeter fraction, and then if we combine all the spectra, we get the uh, we get the satellite mass function. So we are now in liberal galaxies capable uh, towards getting really, uh, really not at merger history yet, because for that we need the timing, and that's that will come in in, in the next part. Yes. So here it looks like in the Eagle simulations, there were never accretions bigger than something or other, but yeah. in the method, you seem to think that there were. Is this because these curves where you were dividing this space were not consistent with the Eagle simulation or? Yes, exactly. Yes. So the uh, the curves are uh, really observate, empirically defined really? curves. Yes. And the Eagle simulations, the what they what they include there in the meta list, et cetera, is, is not perfectly matching. So and that's that's another issue that uh, that we've tried this on different simulations and you get slightly because the uh, because of this match, yes. Exactly. Okay, so this was all on the stellar population side. Yes, and now we have a completely different handle as named, we can also measure the motions of the stars. And so can we also use the stellar dynamics to learn about the buildup of the galaxies? And then the last part will be if we uh, if we combine the two. So just to give you an impression, so in, in addition to all these measurements for this particular galaxies, we can also beautifully measure uh, the, uh, the line of sight velocity distribution of the stars here expressed in maps um, uh, of, of, the, of the moment. So this is the mean velocity. Uh, so uh, red, as we that shift is moving away from us and blue is towards us. So you see that this early type system has a, um, a, a strong rotation like a disk, but also it, this uh, version is uh, uh, really high here. So this is what you expect for a lenticular galaxy, nothing special there. And then uh, these are the higher order moments, the kind of skewness and uh, uh, stosis. So these higher order moments, or the we need uh, to really be able to constrain what comes next is namely we want to extract the orbits of uh, of these galaxies. We want to rebuild this galaxy in three D, so that it comes back to your questions by in principle finding out which uh, which orbits are moving in this gravitational potential. And so, on, in addition, of course, to the first step, we would need to know is the gravitational potential. 
Yes, and that's also um, uh, what, uh, what, what we can do at the same time. Um, so this gives you a very good handle uh, on, uh, so let me explain the method first, sorry. So this is this, this is orbit-based structural technique in one slide. Um, uh, so uh, what, uh, and you see from the 2008, so we were really uh, the uh, 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 one, one here. Um, so what, what you do, you have an image of the galaxy and you have your kinematic observation. This was the uh, uh, SOAR IFU, uh, pretty old one. And for this particular galaxy, it's very nice to illustrate because it looked very boring, a uh, lenticular galaxy again, or early type galaxy. But you see from the kinematics, the velocity field already something special is happening that there is like a, um, an inside here, there's a disc rotating one way and there's a thicker disc rotating the other way. So these are two count rotating stellar discs, yes? So, and then what you do is you, you calculate in an assumed gravitational potential and this assumed gravitational potential comes with higher parameters. So we beforehand don't know, we can include the black hole, we can include the dark, we should include the dark matter halo, but of course we don't know the parameters. So, so every, uh, we, we go through a big grid of high parameters and every, point in a grid of high parameters, we calculate orbits, like 100,000 orbits. And then we ask for each of these orbits, like we give them a potential light weight. And so we ask then, okay, so which orbit should get which weight to, to get back our observations, so the photometry and average kinematics that, uh, that we have. Um, and so this is then the best fit outcome. So what you see here is, first of all, radius. Yes, and what you see here is a kind of measure of uh, uh, angular momentum, where uh, zero means kind of radial orbits and one means uh, circular orbits. And of course, stars can easily counter-rotate if you can also have minus one. And so in principle, we have orbits calculated for every point in this grid, so many, many orbits. And then what you now get is the weight. So these orbits are black because they're not useful. And the white ones, the whiter it is, the more useful these orbits are to explain these observations. And so for you to give an illustration, once you have the best fit model, you can of course pick any orbit and reconstruct your galaxy. And so these are, should run, yes. These are three orbits for you to get an illustration. So the, the green one is so-called Dogs-like orbit. And you see from the edge on view from the model face on view, it's really jumping up and down, so like a radial orbit. And then the red one is a, a, is a prograde rotating, almost circular orbit. Um, and you see it's not perfectly round, but it's staying in a disk. And the blue one is a similar one, but the opposite. Yes, and you need both of these counter and uh, 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 these orbits. You, you see it here, almost equal way to, uh, to exp Playing this uh, picture here. So, for every galaxy, we build these orbit based models. And then, um, what can you do with it? So, first of all, um, the byproduct, as I said, what you get is you, uh, you get a measurement of the total mass, so including dark matter components like the uh, supermassive black hole in the uh, uh, center. And so, here is an example um, where uh, we have different data sets uh, zooming in. So, first of all, again, the Muse. Um, this, is, this is a different um, uh, elliptical galaxy. So here you have the Muse large field of view. Then you zoom into the Muse site and you see that there is some velocity component here. There's actually a nuclear, uh, uh, nuclear star uh, 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 cluster here. And then with Symphony, which is a near infrared um, IFU, you can zoom in even more uh, than we are really at, a, uh, um, at the arc second level. And of course you need this spatial resolution to get closer to the black hole so that you can actually probe the signature of the black hole. And on the bottom is this uh, version measurement we also have H3, H4 at the higher order moment. And what you do is you really build again this, uh, this uh, sweatshirt model, so this orbit-based model, but now you put in also black hole. And you ask it, okay, can it constrain the mass of the black hole? And the answer is, yes, it can. And so the default way, uh, so here you have a measure for the mass to life ratio, which is another, uh, Pre parameter versus the black hole mass. And you first focus on this reddish uh, contours. This would be the traditional way people have been in dynamics doing black hole measurements, or so nearly all black hole measurements are done, where you assume that the mass to light ratio in the inner part of the galaxy is constant. And then on top of it, you have the black hole. So now we ask the question we have this fantastic data set. 
we know actually what the stellar populations are. We know at least what the gradient is, that there's a gradient of stellar mass to light ratio. So if we include a varying mass to light ratio, but we assume the IMF is fixed, yes, then we do one big step forward and we get a different black hole. So you see it's not dramatic, but it's the black hole shifts and the mass to light ratio shifts actually yes so now on top of it for this this new work we did okay but we also know that the imf is changing in this galaxy we measured it this dwarf to giant ratio and it will also affect the mass to light ratio typically if there are more dwarf stars in the center yes then giant stars they can eat up some of the mass that would otherwise go in the black hole yeah so as that expected the black hole mass becomes even smaller yeah simply because the dynamics constraints extremely well the total mass, but what you do now, you put more of the mass, this total mass, into the stars because it's actually a higher fraction of low mass stars, which bring a lot of mass, but less light. So, and what's left is then is for the supermassive black hole. And so this is one galaxy where we start doing this, and you could say, like, Ooh, why does it matter? You go from eight to four. Well, I think it matters because it's a systematic effect. It could be a very uh, uh, systematic effect, but it's also, we should start doing this now as its default because we have the data to include these stellar population effects. So, but that's on the black holes. Then back to my favorite galaxy. Uh, so now, okay, so we have this fantastic, again, this, uh, this lenticular galaxy. So we have our uh, data, yes, at the top. Then we make the Swatchy model. And this is a, these are not 10,000 orbits, but these are many hundred thousand orbits because there's a huge amount of data, yes. And then you can subtract or divide um, the, the data, the model. And you see there are still some residuals, but it's getting really, really good. So this, this swatchy models are typically uh, uh, very, very uh, able to match the uh, uh, data in detail. Okay, fine, then you have a swatchy model, you get some constraints and hyperparameters in the mass center, but can you do more? And this is where we got really excited when we were doing the swatchy models, if when we looked at the orbital structure. So now here is this plot will come back a few times. So, and we already saw it. So this is the center of the galaxy. This is the outskirts of the galaxy. And here again, we have this circularity per, uh, per parameter zero, uh, means radial or bulge-like orbits. Um, plus one uh, is uh, perfectly circular, minus one is counter-rotating orbits. And here are a few examples. And so we call them typically, these orbits are close to one, we call them cold orbits, dynamically cold orbits. Then uh, the ones around zero, we uh, tend to call them hot orbits. Um, and then in between, obviously, we call them warm orbits. And of course, now you see already for this galaxy um, a few interesting uh, features. Yeah, you see a clear, clear, like very strong part here, which is the bulge. Yes, this is a lenticular galaxy with a huge classical bulge. No surprise. Then uh, you see that there's a clear disk com uh, component, so there is a cold disk in here, but there's also these warm orbits, and actually they come in, in blocks. And we are still, I mean, we're investigating, we, we still don't know is this a warm disk, or is this warm orbits because this is contributed by a merger, or induced to from cold to warm orbits by a merger. Yes, and so what is the telltale that something is special happening is these hot orbits in the outer parts. So these are really uh, uh, hot orbits um, on large radius. So these you cannot make in situ. Yes, so these orbits are induced by something. And if you go to simulation, so what we did, we went to TNG uh, simulations with the, what we did is a very simple selection cut we set in a certain total stellar mass and a size range. We pick all the TG simulations, we're like 22 or so, and then we made the same models of these TG simulations. And every time, all of these galaxies except one, which was an ongoing merger, all of them showed the same kind of, like these hot orbits here. Yes. And so the question was, okay, what is causing that? And it turned out that all of these simulations, they had a major merger. Yes, so this is this, this inner, um, uh, inner stellar halo, and uh, I, uh, this, um, uh, I, will, I will come back to that in a second. Oops. Uh, sorry. 
I'd expect a different slide here. Sorry. <laughs> so I will I'll come back to this the, this the, this later. But these hot orbits, this inner 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 halo. Yes, this is really the telltale that something dramatically happened with this galaxy in the past. So story will continue. So one big warning sign here. People have been trying to do these decompositions photomatically, yes, or kinematic photomatically. You see here one reason why photomatically decompositions are, let's say, very challenging to say it nicely. This is the profile. You will say now we can decompose the galaxy's different components. Here are the surface brightness profiles of the bulge, which is clearly this, this yellowish one, which is clearly different. It's like a search with an NS. I think four, around four, so a classical bulge. And then you see the disk, the warm, uh, the warm component, um, and so the cold component, the warm component, and the inner halo, they're all, all similar to exponential. Yeah? So if you do a photomatic decomposition and you say, I'm going to fit an exponential, you're not able to decompose, to distinguish between this, in this cold, warm, and the inner disk. Yeah? So this, this is something we have to be really uh, careful about. Yes. So, so uh, just to give a counting sense, so you have uh, some big number of parameters of these weights, which are like I don't know, is it a hundred thousand, and then a few parameters for the yeah. overall potential or something like that. And the data is what the luminosity in each of the things and some velocity, velocity dispersion. What did you actually? All these, all these maps are fitted. So the surface brightness in uh -huh. detail. This is the velocity, this is the dispersion, this is the higher order moments. And then when you're showing these plots somehow, I mean, because I, I suppose that one can, there's some correlations between this parameter, I don't know, is this an MCMC? What, what is happening with the, this map of weights versus correlates? Yes. Is this the best fit? How does it work? Yes, so um, uh, so it's it's a so you can recast it as as, as a huge matrix, uh -huh. and so you do a matrix in in a inversion, and then of course you can be do smarter tricks because it's actually quite a sparse matrix, and so you can some speed up, uh, but it's it's it principally comes down to a big inversion problem, and big means really big, yes. Yeah? So, but 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 it can be done yes. for a fixed uh, on these intrinsic for a fixed hyperparameters, yes. So we do this for every hyperparameter we have this uh, uh, this infer infer inversion, yeah. So that's why when when I I left here, then we already started uh, with help also from people here. We started to say that we're going to model 300 galaxies, and people looked at us, "You're crazy! This is never going to work." Yes, because this is far too much. And then we presented the first 200 models, I think, in a conference in 2015 or 16. And there were people in the audience that didn't believe these were really models. I had to show them to with the laptop, like, look here, you have this galaxy. Ask me a galaxy number, I will show you a model this computationally. But in the end, we could run it with some smart programming, et cetera, on like a 300 core cluster uh, for a month or two. So it was not too bad, yes. So, but yes, this, this is computationally quite, uh, and Yes, so we, are, we have a, a software engineer involved, and one of the issues is that I cannot get funding to keep on paying the software engineer, which is clearly essential uh, for it. Uh, so if anybody has a suggestion, then very uh, welcome. Uh, so, Chat GPT. Hmm? Chat GPT. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, so to, this is to make the point that you cannot do this now for one galaxy. This is uh, this work by, by us, which I just mentioned in 18, we published and 300 of these galaxies are done. And later on, different people have now done this for, for several hundreds more. Yes, so this is just to say it is not anymore like one by one galaxy, but we can do this statistically. And what is shown here is literally an average of the orbital fractions uh, as function of stellar mass. So you take your uh, stellar mass galaxy 10 to the whatever 10.5, and this gives you in a local universe, this completeness correction gives you how many, what fraction of cold orbits, what fraction of hot orbits, warm orbits within the half-life radius. Why is this exciting? Because all the simulators are really excited by this because they need to match with their T and G elements, and they need to be able to match this because this is representing the orbit fraction in the in the local universe, and they do some don't, etc. But for example, illustrious the T and G illustrious was absolutely no fit with the T and G updates. They they are almost uh, spot on uh, uh, on on these numbers. 
Okay, so now I want to introduce something really new that some people might be excited about. This is really like very, very new because all of these galaxies, we always had to say, yeah, you say spiral galaxies, how do you deal with the bar? And we said, well, so far we didn't, yes. We more or less try to circumvent it by saying the warm orbits are the bar orbits. And then uh, with, how, with, with the fantastic PhD uh, students, we managed to really also now model in the bar properly. And uh, so um, um, if people are interested, please ask me for the, uh, for the details, but here is the galaxy with an obvious bar. Yes, what we do, we make a separate model for the disk and we make a separate model for the bar bulge. Then we add them together, and this is our model. We get some uh, 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 sigils. This just represents the bar. So, photometrically, the biggest challenge was to get a deep, a deep projected model that actually worked. Yes, because you can try to fit this with some kind of technique, and then you find out that uh, available deep projections that actually give you physical solutions are very limited to zero. Yes, so you have to have to uh, do a lot of work to get the intrinsic model, the intrinsic density model um, uh, co co correct. So after a lot of work, this, and I can tell more did this work. And then what, what uh, we did now is, this is not published yet, this is really new, is that we applied this to real data. And again, uh, you see the same, uh, you, uh, you see the same part galaxy, and now in, in, in RAT is again the field of view of this MUSE instrument. And you see that it's still focused on the bar region. It doesn't cover really the disk. And then in the inside is this old um, Sauron data. And so by one of the high parameters now, because we're modeling bar, of course, we have the bar pattern speed. And so the question was, uh, because this is a, a, a key parameter, can we emit this model, even though we don't go out that far in the disk, can we get the bar pattern speed measured? And it turned out to be uh, really well. And actually already with the, the limited data set, you see from the blue contours, you get already a reasonable constraint, but with the, the MUSE data, you of course do better, yes, better data. So you get a very precise measurement. And what we're doing now is working with a team that has used the, the Tremaine-Weinberg method, which is also a, a more traditional method, which goes out in, into the disk to get the bar pattern speed to actually remodel their galaxies for which they have done the bar pattern speed uh, measurements and then see if we get the same, uh, the same answer as a, a project that we're doing now. Okay, so why does, does this work and why does this work? So maybe that it does work. So here is the velocity field, the dispersion field, sorry for a little bit crappy figure, but this is what I had. Um, and then here is the best fit model for fixed pattern speed. And this is the residual. This is for the velocity and this is for the dispersion. If you focus on the velocity and especially on the residuals, you see if you increase the bar pattern speed, the residuals go down. And then if you increase it again, they go up again. So there's a clear minimum. So there is information in both the velocity and the dispersion and actually in higher order moments, which really tells you that it needs particular, that needs this bar pattern speed and a particular set of orbits. So if people are interested, well, I'm happy to talk about it. So why are we so excited about this um, is that now we have a method which at the same time consistently gives the pattern speed with the, it gives the gravitational potential. So we can get the co-rotation radius of the system like measured in the same way. Then from the same method, we get actually the intrinsic 3D distribution. Yes, yeah, so we can also measure where the bar ends in, in 3D. And so we have a direct measurement of the so-called rotation rate, which is the co-rotation rate is over the bar length. Yes, and this was the first galaxy we did, not particular picked on a particular reason, but we found already that this R value is well is, is, is above two. Why is this exciting? Because this then so falls into the so-called slow bars. And these are the predictions for a long time already that if you have embedded within a dark matter halo, then the torque of the dark matter halo, once the bar is formed, will slow it down, yes? The moment you form a bar, you can only form so-called fast and long bars. That's how you form them. And if you then have this torque with the dark matter halo, it will slow it down <coughs> and shorten it, yes? But so far, there are very few, and I would say 
like really trusted measurement of slow bars have been very, very few. Almost all of them fall in, into the regime of fast alone, and sometimes even below one in which not physical, yes? But there are a lot of complications with this measurement because you get the Tremaine Weinberg, you get the pattern speed, and then you need the photometry to get the bar, and just the projected bar, like, et cetera, et cetera. Then the key thing here is that uh, it all comes consistently from one model, yes? So either it's all wrong, or it indeed gives you a consistent result. So this is the first one, and already turned out to be a, a, a slow bar. And of course, we want to do this for more systems. So then on top of it, you also get really the intrinsic orbit distribution. So you can look at the different orbits, at which orbits make up the so-called box peanut, X bar, um, the bulge in a disk, the ring, et cetera. So you can really reconstruct your uh, galaxy because it does actually have all these different resonance orbits also in it. Okay, so then the last part is, of course, trying to combine them both. Yes, because you get complementary information, as we saw on the merger history on the system from the stellar population, but the stellar population doesn't say anything really directly about when these mergers happen. And from the dynamics, yes, we get the really, um, uh, re really interesting information about the intrinsic. Um, uh, dynamical evolution, but we also got these orbits. So can we combine the two to find out actually like if and when a merger happens? And this is in principle this question so far, if you talk about, and this is just a quick cartoon, time of the merger and mass of the merger, if you really ask the question for how many systems do we know that we only know this actually for the Milky Way and 31, uh, where we have this Gaia and, Sol and uh, Solaris sausage like about 10 million years ago, um, and a, at a certain mass, and for at the Andromeda, we have uh, very strong indications that there was a, a major merger, which was massive about two billion years ago. And so now the question is, can we do this for more nearby galaxies? And uh, so then back to this particular galaxy, which I already showed, is the same image, uh, the same same picture. We have a structure model. So now what we did, this is the new thing. Okay, why not follow these orbits? Yes, why not put HM metallicity to start with, and later on we can put more HM metallicity and ask the question fits then also all this stellar population information you have. And so that's what we did literally. So we took all those like tens of thousands of orbits and we asked for each of the orbits, in addition to fitting the kinematics, we also asked, like, okay, it has to fit the kinematics. And why is this nice? Because of these orbits, of course, when it's a radial orbit, it goes out and in, and even a circle orbit, they bring information from different regions, yeah? So if you call it this particular orbit rat, yes, then it has to be rat all over the place, yes? So you see that this can converge because, because of the backbone information you have. And so this is then a map, this is the data for the age, um, and this for the stellar metallicity, and you see that it matches well, okay? So then you get complicated pictures, yes? So uh, which we are still thinking how to visualize it. So this is the plot you already saw, yes? So this this radius versus circularity, where I was really excited about this inner halo. And this is just colored with the light weight. And now you can color them with the age and with the metallicity, yes? And now is the question, you have a huge amount of main, what do you extract from this? And so, for example, again, you can get profiles out of this. So you get now, in addition to the surface brightness profile, you can look at the profile in stellar age. So you see for the disk, there's an interesting upturn, which might mean something. But if you focus on the rat, which is the inner halo, you see it's old, and you see that it is still relatively metal rich, but it is from the system actually a quite metal poor component. And this still relatively metal rich, yes, makes it already hinting towards this must be brought in or at least induced by something happening in the past, something big. And so what turns out to be is that we went again to these TG simulations, these 22, and we did exactly the same exercise. And then if you plot for these simulations, which are the black dots here, yes, if you plot the mass of this interstellar halo, and you ask that what was the mass of the last major merger that happened, then it turned out to be that this is very strongly correlated. Does it mean that all the mass in the inner halo comes from this major merger, but at least it induced all of the stars in this hot? Yes. And so you can also show that actually the metallicity uh, matches. In the end, 
Practically speaking, what you can then do is, this is our observation. We have a very nice measurement, and literally you read off from the correlation how massive this major merger was. Okay, fine. But now we want to know when it happens. And this is the really interesting part. At least I find this really exciting. So here now you have same circularity. So cold orbits, these hot orbits, and warm in between and the other side. But now we plot versus stellar age. Yeah, so this is old, yeah, so the beginning of the universe to here. And what we then realize in this simulated galaxy, yeah, so it is one of these, these many points, what we realize that is that up to like around here, eight giga years, yes, you have a huge spread in orbits. But this system, when it started, it started off as a nice disk, actually. What happened is that it had a major, major merger around this time. Yes, and that's completely screwed up like all the orbits from cold to warm. Yes, it's completely mixed the whole system. That's what's here. And then the merger was over. The system settled, there was leftover gas, and this gas started reforming in a nice cold disk stars. And since then, very little happened to the inner part of this galaxy where some minor merged in the outer parts, but nothing. And so you can really see this change from like all type of orbits to um, certainly only cold orbits. And this is your key point of when, when the merger ends. And so if you then go to this observed galaxy now, you make the same plot. Oh yeah, sorry, this is of course how the simulator looks at it. This is how the observer has to look at it because this after all, like here again, we made an IFU cube with the stretching modeling, the coloring, et cetera. Um, so to mimic what we get as, as from the modeling side, this is then for the real galaxy, that one there. And then you see also the same thing happening. It's like all type of orbits. And then suddenly there is no hot or warm orbits, only cold orbits. Yes. So this gives you a timer of there must be a merge happening for a system. And it must have ended around this time here. And because on, if there would be not a major merger, then all these cold, these cold orbits, some of them would at least end up here, but it's empty. Yes, so this is a very nice timing mechan uh, uh, mechanism. Okay, so sorry, yes, yes. Only yes. Five minutes I'm done. This is the last. Uh, uh, so the just want to show this for the Milky Way. Yes, and these have maybe some people have been seeing these plots. This is now the same similar plots, but then invert in the time just to make it conf uh, confusing for you. But what I want to show you in this shape that you see here, yes, is the same shape that you see in this plot for the Milky Way. So the Milky Way, we time this by Enceladus. We can time it in a, in a, in a similar way as, as we can do now for a nearby galaxy. So final proof, if you're still not convinced, is this plot here. Yeah, so what we did here is this, um, what you show you is again the age. Yes, um, from old beginning of the universe to now here. And what the plot is here is the scale height of the cold disk. And this is the velocity dispersion of the cold disk. So age velocity relation, maybe people um, uh, recognize. And so what are shown here in the squares is literally we go to our Swatchell model and we pick all the cold orbits. And because we have the age, we know when they were formed. And that's what we put on the age axis. And now you see that in red is a simple, well, not simple, is, is an actually very nice analytical, team analytical disk growth model. Yes, which is purely based on a completely independent measure, namely the star formation history. So the red curve has nothing to do with black dots because the red curve is really only based on stellar population, probably named the star formation history. Yes. And so what this model assumes, this model assumes there were no external perturbations. But I just told you there was. Well, the nice thing is that if you now repeat the same plot, but now you measure the dispersion and the height, this height of all the orbits, yes, then you get these black points here, yes. So these are much higher than if you would only focus on the cold orbits. And the reason they are much higher is that they got heated, but they didn't get heated internally. They got heated because they were slammed from outside by a major merger. So. And you see that, like after eight big years, they match each other. Yes, that's that's here. But before 
like the stars that were older, they, they got a kick from this major merger. And so this deviation tells you that something from outside and uh, perturb uh, perturbation happened. So this is additional proof that there was a major merger happening to the system. And so in principally, that's uh, where I then would like to end this so we can start adding like major mergers past ancient major mergers um, uh, to this uh, plot here. And last slide is really there's a, of course, not me, but the whole group behind uh, to do this. And I particularly want to point you out is that we actually publish our code. We make our code publicly available in different releases. This bar model and the problem is not yet there. We're working on it. But if people are interested, we also give regular workshops. We had one in Australia a few months ago. Um, so uh, the, um, uh, then, then you can have a look here. And above are the team members currently involved. Thank you. And so we have time for questions. Regarding this black hole uh, mass measurements in the uh, centers of galaxies, can you apply uh, the same tool, you know, use and so on for global clusters in our galaxy and look for intermediate mass black holes? Um, or if maybe somebody is doing this already and they you know. Yes. Uh, 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 so not Muse. Yes. Um, Why not? Uh, because the the if you well, might have to be. Yes. Uh, it's still it's it's still too well. Yes and no. Um, yes, there are integral field unit measurements of the uh, uh, of global clusters of the Milky Way, but uh, you have to take into account that uh, you really have to then distinguish between the bright stars. Yes, so you get this, uh, uh, you, you, the IFU really only will work if you have cleaned out the bright stars, because otherwise they, they, in, 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 they induce uh, stochastic uh, uh, noise and stochasticity. But yes, you can do this. And so we're actually doing this now for Omega Sun. We have like a huge amount of news pointings. So what we do is we have a technique to extract the, the, the resolve stars. Once you like deconvolve your IFU cube with the resolve stars, what you have left is the low mass stars. And this gives you this diffuse, and that gives you the same integral field unit measurements as you have here. Yes, so yes, uh, that's ongoing. Uh, several people have tried this already in the past. Unfortunately, the, uh, the constraints from that, even using the same data, has been completely orthogonal in groups saying like there is a black hole and groups saying there is none. Yes, so there is still a lot of controversy. Processing. 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 So exactly, so there is that. that's one, and the other is the modeling that they apply. Yeah, so typically then they go through all this effort and then they apply an isotropic spherical genes model, which is, is, is not, the best way to go forward, let's put it nicely. Um, and so both on the modeling side as well as on the data side, there are, there are still um, uh, like challenges to, to overcome, but people are, uh, are uh, working on this. Yes. And especially Muse is, is great because now we also have this narrow field of view with an AO, which gives you fantastic spatial resolution, which actually is better than HST, which is then we are again a problem because we're using HST to find the right stars. Yes, so now we are in this loop, like how do we get like uh, now the bright stars out of it? So if you want to hear more and more, I'm happy to talk about it. I had a PhD student working on this from the modeling side, showing that even if you have this fantastic data set, we have to be very careful because we might in many cases only get an upper limit. Um, uh, and this is uh, mostly by the limitation of our knowledge on the stellar population side. So this sounds a bit weird, but we really need to be able, to, if we wanted to, we get the total mass, it's not a problem, perfectly spot on. But then, of course, to get the black hole mass, we need to subtract between codes model in the stellar mass. So then we need to know exactly the counting of the stellar mass. And there we run into still into problems that the stellar population models are not good enough. So. I think there will be some really big changes also there, but at the moment it sounds a little bit crazy, a bit strange, but at the moment we're hitting the point that we are limited by some of the stellar population models. Uh, so just to continue on the globular clusters for a minute, you've argued that 
you know, the galaxies show this rich, colorful history that you can extract um, from the integral field measurements. What about the globular clusters? Are they completely quiescent? Did everything happen 13 giga years ago with globular clusters? So, uh, so um, uh, a different uh, uh, slides would be about that you can equally complementary use globular clusters not only as traces to get the gravitational potential, but actually they are measured velocities and metallicity to see how the the, the galaxy build up because every uh, time that the satellite emerges will bring in global clusters. And so you can use then the population of global clusters to, to really reconstruct uh, also. And Ryan Lehman, especially, we're now making a forward model where we tag on uh, like uh, on satellites, global clusters, and then we have the merge with the host galaxy. We make a huge library, and then we're trying to figure out using as complementary the global clusters. Can we uh, cover uh, this? So this is then all global clusters brought in by uh, by satellite galaxies. If you're referring to proto global clusters, high redshift universe, that's uh, that 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 we that we're not including it here. I, I'm not sure. It's, I was thinking mostly about the internal dynamics of a single globular cluster. Oh, yes. That is, does that show it? For example, it could be that when you apply the same techniques to a single globular cluster, you find evidence of a merger uh, a few, few billion years ago. Oh, I haven't thought about that. In our so, right? Yeah. Yeah. You so, a merger of the global cluster with that. So it's, <laughs> it's pretty imp implausible, but yeah. you know what we consistency. For example, yes. Omega San, like there we have made the Schwarzschild model, and uh, there we see that it's not a global cluster as a classical global cluster because it has an inner disk, central disk. It has in the outer part clearly uh, tangential anisotropy, which is caused from the, the most logical solution is caused because it was being stripped off, like the outer part was being stripped off. But Omega San is the wrong, it's not a global cluster, it's a nuclear star cluster. So it should have, it was a center of a galaxy, it should have this, this complexity. What you're asking, indeed, I think, so that's an interesting question. So the for sure for the nuclear star clusters, yes. Yes, we will, we should be able to model them, and then we should be able to see. Uh, in a similar way, whether this nuclear star cluster was built from like global clusters that uh, that that fell into the center, or like due to dynamical friction, and we should be able to find out how much was in, in, in situ formed for nuclear star clusters. For global clusters, I mean, a merge of global clusters is super unlikely, so that would be. Uh, but yeah, I'm not sure what what we should expect. Uh, we, we do find internal rotation in global clusters, so it will be interesting to see whether this claim, we also made this claim that, for example, in the core of global clusters, we see a spinning core, yes? Whether this is, uh, uh, whether this is really holding up when you make an, 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 a proper uh, swatch model, that would be. So, so how many of the globular clusters in our galaxy are actually nuclear star clusters? Omega Sen and what else? So Omega Sen and M54 are for sure, like the nuclear star clusters. And uh, then there could be a few more, but only a few. Yes. Uh, so, um, so from different indications, so for example, from this over dispersion, yes. So Omega Sen and M54 are, are off the relation, both of them, which you should expect because they are uh, like merger remnants in that sense. Uh, so we don't have indications on metallicity spreads for significant ones for many. There are a few more candidates, massive global clusters, which could be uh, also nuclear star clusters. But it's actually not completely trivial to find out whether or not it's, uh, it's, uh, it's stripped off or naked nuclear star cluster or whether it's a global cluster. But yes, so the... Omega Sen and M54, obviously, because it's still inside of its district. And Omega Sen, I mean, is uh, of the obvious candidate for this, the Gaia Enceladus, uh, uh, the nuclear star cluster for the Gaia Enceladus. There are no more questions, we can continue over lunch. 
Thanks. Uh, the